Eight o'clock Eastern Wednesday. That can only mean one thing. It is time for reruns of Frasier. No, just kidding. It is Taxes and Retirement Live. I am Andy Panko, uh, moderator of Taxes and Retirement, owner of Tenant Financial. Got a special one tonight. Tonight I'm joined by special guest, Beth Rowan of Evergreen Ally. And hello, Beth. Hello. How are you, Andy? I'm swell. How are you? Good. Good. Happy to be so here. Awesome, happy to have you. So, so Beth is an expert in emergency preparedness and disaster recovery and started a company around that called Evergreen Ally based in New York City, correct? Yes. So I, we met virtually since, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in a pandemic world through a mutual friend, mm -hmm. another uh, advisor I know who you know as well. And he linked us up and said, you know, he is aware of what I'm doing here on Facebook and uh, he's aware of you and what you do. He's like, hey, I think you two would be a good match. Um, so anyway, so he reached yeah. out and I was like, yeah, you know, what you do best seems really cool. Now it is off the beaten path, the typical nerdy sort of tax and investment retirement financial <laughs> planning we do. Um, but nonetheless, emergency preparedness and what you're going to discuss, vitally important to everyone, not just retirees, right? Exactly. No, it definitely is. And you're totally right. I mean, nobody really is doing what I'm doing. So yeah. often when I talk about what I do, people are like, what? Um, but it is, I'm very passionate about it and it's important and it's important to audience like you have because it all comes back to planning yeah. and what kind of life we want to live um, and emergency readiness really affects all of us. So I'm happy to be here to talk to everyone about it. Awesome. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So, so I, I got, I got this, this shtick idea with dad jokes. Okay. Hopefully you're okay with that. Yes. Um, if you don't laugh, that's okay. That that may be funnier, actually, but I'll, I'll leave it to you how you choose to handle this. All right. Just so everyone's clear, I'm going to put my glasses on. All right. Get it? So I can see. Uh -huh, uh -huh. A commander walks into a bar and orders everyone around. And finally, I'm probably going to butcher this because it's hard to say. Never buy flowers from a monk. Only you can prevent florist friars. See where I'm going. See where I'm going with that. Yeah, yeah, I do. It's terrible. So, so now you're like, what am Maybe I doing here? Why did I sign up for this? Like that. Yeah. It, it must have been. Yeah, yeah. Like, how did I get myself <laughs> rubbed into this nonsense? Exactly. Um, exactly. And just before we get going, let me just give everyone a disclaimer. As always, this video is only mm -hmm. general explanations and education. It is not specific tax, legal, investment advice, or even emergency preparedness device uh, mm -hmm. specific to you. Before considering acting on anything you see in this video, first consult with your tax, legal, investment, or emergency preparedness advisor. Mm -hmm. How about that? Yes, great. Um, one final housekeeping for folks at home regarding questions. As always, feel free to, to post whatever questions, comments you have. We will try to hold them uh, uh, to the end, but we will um, get to your questions nonetheless. So thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Beth, emergency preparedness. Yes. What is it, right? What That's is it? Yeah. Usually the first question. It is not guys in hazmat groups. Um, that is not what I do. Emergency preparedness, the basic definition are the steps that you take to, to keep yourself safe before, during, and after an emergency or a disaster. And what I found working through my parents' disaster is that that definition doesn't do enough for most people. It doesn't become relevant for most people. Um, it definitely does address your safety. Physical safety is first, but then what? So my parents live in California in um, 2017. Their house was destroyed by wildfire. Mm. Um, they woke up in the middle of the night, thankfully. Um, they didn't get any warning and they escaped with their lives, but very little else, and then found that their home was completely destroyed and everything else. And so here, what I learned working with them is that it's actually the trauma of surviving a crisis that also that often like really devastates people. Mm. Um, and so when I went out there to help them rebuild their lives and claim what they were entitled to, I mean, I hadn't done this before. My background was in strategic planning. I worked for companies and, you know, I did risk assessment and analysis, but interestingly enough, those like skill set that I've used my whole career and my personal traits actually helped me, helped me be successful in helping my parents. Okay. Um, and it was a fight. And so that is something that I think 
people don't realize in crisis, or maybe they do, and that's why people don't want to think about it. Yeah. Um, but I came back and did research and realized that this was a business, that there were many people out there, there was a void that wasn't being filled, and that I could do something to help people. So I started my company. Great. Now, it's interesting. I never really thought about this, but you said um, a lot of the, the crisis and the, and the dealing with it is, or you know, adverse impacts are obviously after, you know, living through mm -hmm. the fallout as opposed to the event itself. Well, clearly you lose a home, you lose stuff, but the, the right. after effect after that is, is, is bad. It right. Sounds like, right. Yeah. And it is like, again, it personal, your, your survival is the most important thing. So oftentimes people say like, Oh, well, you know, at least you made it out and you're right. Cause there are some people that didn't make it out. Right. Um, but, I think the tragedy really also just compounds because the next day is you have no home. What do you do? You have yeah. nothing. Like, and, mm. and you know, that like long term, you know, you, the next day you don't have a home and the next day you don't have a home. And so you're, you're supposed to go through this process of rebuilding your life and you like don't even have a place to go. Yeah. And so that's the part uh, in helping them when there were so many things that came up and I guess it was like the planner in me, right? Or it was like, oh, if, if we had done this, then this would have been easier or this is interesting to know because then we should do this. And so that's where I really put put together a business that mostly goes after getting people prepared beforehand. I don't want to be just the person that, you know, is called in after something happens. I want to help people mitigate um, and survive. The, the key is resilience. I want people yeah. to recover and thrive. And, and how much of what you do is um, traditional sort of property and casualty, if you will, loss of home, loss of house, um, versus just other, whatever they may be, other life emergencies, be it uh, health, uh, death, you know, other unforeseen things I'm not thinking of at the yes. moment. It, it actually is. I, I cover all those areas. And okay. so that's why I like th that we were connected to people is because um, I have good connections to more traditional roles, okay. like financial planners, trust and estates attorneys, right? Because I touch on all those things. So I do a risk assessment for my clients. And that is both what they're most worried about um, the makeup of their home and household, what yep. is most at risk for them. And then also the science of where they live, where they work, um, what are the perils that are most likely to occur or that they're most okay. worried about or that hurts them the most. And then we go through patching all that together and making plans so that they know what to do. Interesting. And maybe I'm getting ahead of us, but um, is there any type of person or sort of profile of person that's best suited or, or benefit most from emergency preparedness and what you do? Or is it just kind of obviously anyone who has something to lose uh, um, is, is at, you know? Yeah, it? no, it's a good question. Um, people who have built a life and that don't want to give it all the way by a bad mistake. Okay. I yeah. mean, and, and, and it, it's not to sound petty. Everybody works very hard. And, and I'm sure it's what you talk with people in retirement is we know it's out there. We know it's out yeah. there. And, you know, people can't wake up the day before, right? They're going to retire and say, oh, I have to like think about stuff. And so it is for people who have built something. They've built a legacy. And it doesn't have to be... $500 million. It's you've built a life that you want to either leave to people or in retirement, you want to have a nice life. And so those are people that want to make sure that they're not throwing away money or that they're going to miss out on money because that's yeah. like, that's getting the second slap, right? That's getting, right. okay, your house burned down on top of it. Oh, guess what? You're not really going to get that much money for it. <laughs> like so that you can't rebuild right. Right. like that's, I mean, that's what my parents dealt with is, not keeping up with their insurance. And you would ask the question about how much it is, is insurance and policies and all that type of stuff. It, it does, it, that is what is involved in emergency preparedness. It's also legal aspects and your trust and your wills. So I yeah. really weave into a lot of these holes that people don't know um, what the impact is. And I want people to not, to know what to expect. I guess, you know, right. okay. and again, not to just be in fear. That's what keeps us probably from planning and addressing these things is that we just don't even want to know all the things that could happen. Right. And so wouldn't it be great to know that when this happens, you know exactly what to do. You know, you're not going to get financial loss. You know, you, you're not yeah. going to get that domino effect of crisis. 
And, and that's really important that the planning ahead. And even I, I see it um, in terms of like discussing wills and sort of end of life scenarios. Some people jump right in and like, yes, I realize it's important. Let's right. let's think through this now. Other people can't deal with the the mortality or morbidity of it and just simply right. don't want to discuss it. And then the time comes and something God forbid happens and um, you know, mm -hmm. the people you left behind are, are, you know, the ones who have to pay for it, but yes. not, to, not to blame people for not doing it. But the point is, it's very important to think all this stuff through, not just life and medical scenarios, but property, housing, right. other things. And that's, that's everything that you do, right? Right. Yes. And you're right. right. It's, it's difficult conversations. Sometimes it's actually easier for someone who's not inside a family or yeah. not a loved one to broach certain of those topics. And, you know, my goal is to provide options. Um, yeah. and provide information so people people can make a sound decision or at least know what their options are. Like I find that's often what people don't know. And, and like you said, is you, if you're working so hard to have a retirement, right, you probably sit down with people and say like, what do you want to do in retirement? Like <laughs> yeah. is your idea like sitting back and you know, like mowing the lawn and being in a hammock in the backyard or is it right. like traveling around the world, seeing your family? That's gonna, affect how you plan right your finances and so yeah. it's the it's the same thing is that you work so hard for life and it may be like i you know i'm going to live to 100 and i just want a comfortable life that's great right or yeah. i want to save and i want to leave something to somebody then then that becomes part of the plan and when people like you said aren't addressing what our what, what our wishes are it's like You've controlled your life your whole, the whole time, and now you're just going to give away that. Like your loved ones want to give you the send off that you want. Don't you want right. to design what that is, right? And and I, I don't know. I, I see a bit more clients who who work with me want to retain that control, um, and and. Control, I know, sometimes is like on PC now. Like you're not supposed right. to say it. <laughs> yeah. It really is about choices. Like choices, choices. We all feel better when we have more choices, and so that's what I think is helpful for people to think about: is what are the what choices do you have, and then you you get to choose them. And it's great that there's there's folks like you to help uh, kind of prod these conversations along because people probably don't know what they don't know. Like like for me, prior to working in financial planning, emergency preparedness was having flashlights and batteries. Right. Um, right. You know, when I was a teenager learning to drive. Mm -hmm. got my license emergency preparedness was my mom telling me to make sure i had clean underwear on every time i left the house i right. still don't know i still right. know where she's going with that but whatever no. Um, no. you know so, and, and now i'm realizing i have a family have a house like oh yeah this stuff compounds it gets bigger and as you progress through life it, there's right. just more things for better right. or worse to have to uh uh, protect and protect against so right yeah and and part of it is is that it's that constant challenge in life right we want automatic gratification so like if i can buy something it makes me feel better right and, and yeah. i know there are things online like your emergency pack i mean i i've seen these things and it's like okay first of all i live in new york city why do i need a bunsen burner <laughs> in my right. you know like so but it so it gives people a sense of false security, right? And and your mom, I mean, okay, maybe that made her feel good, like knowing that if something happened to her son, he'd be wearing clean underwear. Clean underwear the yeah. reality is, is, did that really help you? Did that give you a tool, like, right, to prevent to prevent or mitigate something? Um, <laughs> no. So, so I'm, I'm more realistic, um, and I think probably in your field, you are too. And so it, it is dealing with the emotion people have about things, and but it is talking about the realistic things, and and, and it is. I can't prevent awful things from happening, right? I mean, right. It, it, there are some things that you can mitigate, but it really is about how you respond to them. And and the complexity in my business is that there's panic involved in it. So, mm -hmm. right? So besides just the not planning, it's the panic usually keeps us from making sound decisions and from productive actions, um, right. right? Just follow the mob. like. Right, like when the pandemic started, people are just running around chasing people, hoarding toilet paper. Like, what was yes. that about? Yes. Like, it was like we didn't know what to do, so that's what people were doing. I saw, I saw that guy run and get toilet paper. I want to get toilet paper. I got to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so, so the idea is to really make people feel better by really discussing, okay, where do you live? And so, like, if there's a fire in your apartment and you're getting older, okay, then that is something that we have to think about because. Do you have the strength to open the window to get out, 
right? Yeah, so right. Okay. Um, how are you going to get down the stairs? I mean, that is a realistic thing to talk about um, in, in, instead of, right, like I'm going to just bring, what do I need in my pack? That's the other sure. thing is most of the go bag items are personal stuff to you, meaning you can't go to a store and buy it, right? Mm. There are some things, like you said, a flashlight, that's good. But the things that I help people get together are the important documents, your vital ID and documents that you need, again, the next day. Sure. So how are you going to get back up on your feet, right? How are you going to kind of um, continue? I, I call it a household continuity plan because people are often like very familiar with business continuity plans. Yeah. And this is less about IT and more about okay, what do you need to access the next day? And what what does your family need? And people have different personal needs. Um, and that's why I think like the general information out there, people, it doesn't resonate with them because it just seems so basic. Um, yeah. So you started, you, you mentioned before like the, the domino effect of things. And I guess what you just said, house burns down, what do you need the next day? A personal ID, whatever else. Like, can you just elaborate more on sort of sure. the domino idea you walk people through and, and the other considerations that a lot of people probably don't think of outside of, sure. yes, I need homeowner's insurance or something? Right. So, yeah. So, okay. So I'll use the example with my parents because that was also like digging, right? I had to dig, uh -huh. like, what do you do? So, um, so you have to make a claim, right? That's what everyone yep. would know. Something happened to my house, I have to make a claim. Well, let me see your policy. Oops. Do, do you have it? Do, do you know what the number is? <laughs> okay. I mean, who, right? Yeah. So you may know the salesperson like who called you, but now what is actually in your policy? Okay. Um, now you're going to go borrow, you know, your car was good and now you're going to go to a temporary, so you're going to go um, find a temporary place to live. So on top of this, you have to find temporary housing. You have to figure out how you're gonna start a claim. Um, what about your documentation? So your passport's mm -hmm. gone, your wallet. I mean, nowadays all of that's tied together. And yeah. one of the things people tend to think is that I live online, my whole life is online. Guess what? Your life is not online. Your Amazon account is <laughs> online and your shopping history is. But you as a person is still in a file cabinet down like at City Hall. So <laughs> your birth certificate, that's like big tip for everyone. Get your birth certificate, your official reel with the seal on it, get duplicate copies. You can get official duplicate copies because okay. now with everything being tied together and if you live somewhere that's not where you were born, like that's the type of research that like is necessary when something happens. And can you imagine like getting on the phone with someone from City Hall that like, how do I get my birth certificate, you know, my birth yeah, certificate, yeah, yeah. your driver's license, your, you know, your, all your kids documentation. So those are the types of things. So it becomes a crisis. And then with, um, if you have a medical emergency, right, that can turn into a financial crisis. If you're not tied up with your insurance and how are you going to process that? And then how much did you have to pay up front? And you know what I mean? Like at the end of the day is you want to make sure that your loved one is getting better. And so sure. sometimes it's all these technicalities and the paperwork just overwhelms people. And so what I do from an advocacy side is that's exactly the point of some of these businesses. I mean, at the end of the day, your person and their business. So a hospital right. is a business, right? Um, when someone dies, it's like the lawyers and the courts, that's a business, right? Insurance is a business. Yeah. So you are a person dealing with these businesses and it's your personal life and to them it's business. And so that's yeah. where a lot of the conflicts, you know, go through a death okay. in the family can become a legal fight, right? Because sure. someone didn't, you know, tie everything up or, you know, um, didn't communicate certain things. And so now there's a family fight. So those are the types of things that really get like rolled up. That's All interesting because right. people, yeah, don't think about that. You think about I, I lose a house. Yes, I'm, you know, I'm out some clothes and whatever, some important mm -hmm. documents. But this could drag on for months, if not longer, with this right. hassle and headache, right? Yeah, right. And wow. probate is different in every state, so there are a lot of laws. Actually, you know, most of the laws that deal with death, yeah, um, you know, custody with children and all that. Um, it's by state, and even insurance. How strong? 
um, advocacy do they have versus um, insurance carriers? So depending if you also live somewhere and then you move, that's another thing to really look at are those laws when you move or you're right. thinking about moving for retirement um, because you know, you're know you gonna leave this to your state and then you don't realize that because you didn't take care of certain things is actually it's gonna be lawyer's fees that yeah. gonna, you know gonna be paid yeah. off. So trying to just bring this back to, you know, this is a sort of financial focus group. Yes. Um, people think in stats and figures and numbers and dollars. Mm -hmm. um, if you had to sort of, I don't know, quantify or sort of get across to people, not just this group of folks in general, like to put some numbers behind this, why is this important? What are we talking about? People know the value of their house if that gets burned down, you know, that right. they can feel and, and, and mm -hmm. visualize. Right. But otherwise, like how else do you get across to people? This is why this stuff is important. Right. Okay. So I, I start with my clients like, okay, what's the number that you can live with losing? Um, like, okay. right. What's their, what's their risk tolerance and, and their pain threshold? Because if you're talking about insurance, people will think, oh, I don't want to like review that because I don't want to pay more in insurance, like premiums a year. Right. Yeah. That's what we all think of is what are we going to pay a year? But the dollar amount is 60% of American homeowners are underinsured by 20%. So wow. to use an example is if you're dwelling, which is the actual like building your house, yep. if that's 300,000 in your, in your policy. So if you're one of the 20%, that means you're $75,000 loss, right? So if my house burns down tomorrow, it's gonna cost They're gonna three. give you 300, it's, but if it's yeah. underinsured, it means it actually should be 375. Okay. That's what the, you know, in, um, the Insurance Institute is saying. Um, and it's because people don't review it over time. Yeah. And if you have a house for a really long time, the whole idea of it is, is not the market value, right? We all know what our house is worth on Zillow, right? Yeah, yeah. Like we're always looking at that. But this is about to rebuild and replace it. So if you have a, a, a house that's 20 years old or 30 years old, that's like built really well, right? I always think of it's the same like with furniture. Like, is it yeah. Ikea or do your grandmother yeah. give it to you? Because the value of that dresser is really different. So in a home, if you have to rebuild it now, and you don't have certain things covered in your and updated in your policy, you're gonna be out that money. So it's just gonna be frustrating because you'll have to make a choice. Do I downsize or do I take money out of my retirement fund right. or my That's kid's college? Um, so it's like those types of expectations. Also our belongings, you know, the personal proper contents is the area where, you know, in a lot of insurance carriers, um, We'll say sure. I'll, that's your minimum. I mean, you know, your, that's your like maximum. Ten thousand like, bucks or something, right? Or... Can I have? Can I have a list of everything that you owned and what the value is and what year it was and? Yeah. You have that? Like. No. <laughs> you know, even like damage, like a like a room, right? Like someone like yeah. a tree falls and is the kitchen. So it's not even. It's not just for people, um, whose house would you know gets totally destroyed. Also, um, let's talk about flooding because actually yeah. that's the biggest damage um, that the most fluent, um, frequent, sorry, okay. damage that happens um, is water and freezing damage. So the average across the whole country is $11,000 of damage a year. Oh. And it's one per, in 50 okay. homes. Okay, so, so when they do have flood damage, the average is $11,000 of, of loss, of, right. of damage. Okay. Right, okay. and depending on where that water and flood are, you may not be covered for it, which means yeah. it's totally out of pocket. So that's where I just think the changing climate change, right? We see Texas got frozen. Um, you yeah. know, we have like the tornadoes down south, we have the flooding and the Iowa farm. So things are happening. Um, at, at more of a degree. In fact, this year alone, we've already had a $10 billion damage and that's just natural disaster. So all those, wow. free, the freezing that happened, um, that was $10 billion. Um, that's crazy. So, yeah. Something that shouldn't have happened in the first place or historically has never happened, right? Or at least right. not to that magnitude. Yeah. Right, right. But I guess it's, you know, it comes down to, it's, it's your risk as far as like, are you gonna sit here and say, well, I lived in Texas for 20 years and that never happened. It's like, okay, but it happened now. <laughs> right, and now right. it hit you for $50,000. Are you okay with that? Then fine, you know? Yeah. I'm just like the flooding. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not covered in normal insurance. So if you don't want to yeah. pay for flood insurance, then just know that 
that that's what you're saving. Um, Ra random question. Do you recommend, so even if you're not in a floodplain, you're not a coastal area or not otherwise in a designated flood zone, you're not near any sort of brook or stream or whatever. Um, do you advocate people should get flood insurance kind of just because? Because um, why not, especially if it's, you know, reasonably right. inexpensive? Well, there are there are tools um, that we use, like flood, flood zones that um, mm. every city and state updates um, based on what the probability is. Okay. Um, and also it's about what are the different things, like do you live in a place that's freezing? Because again, water damage can be from, you know, storms and stuff right, like that yeah, okay. um, falling through. So it really is knowing what you're covered for and what you're like, what you're likely to happen. Now, when it comes to what you, what you um, asked about flood, it's not as arbitrary as just having it. It's about you understanding what the costs are and knowing that that's what you're gonna risk. Because okay. if something does back up, you know, and knowing what the policy says, because I can't tell you how many people are getting hurricanes and flood and storm surge and they're like, I have insurance. It's like, no, you yeah. don't have insurance. So a lot of it is education, you know, and bringing that information and just knowing what the cost is. Um, but again, that's why I get confused why people stay behind when they're like warning people to evacuate. Cause it's like, how are you stopping that? That, you know, well, uh, so <laughs> again, what I want to bring to people is if you had everything you needed with you, you knew what you had to grab, you had a plan of where to go, you knew that financially you were covered. Yeah. Wouldn't that be such a relief? Wouldn't that be like, oh, I have to evacuate? Okay, I know exactly what to do. I think what happens is people just don't know what the option is. So yeah. like, where do I go? What do I do? So I, I think that's what I'm hoping to bring people is some, like call it peace of mind, is like right. there are things that you can really physically do and changes that you can make. And it does come down to dollars and it does come down to fear and yeah. what you're worried about and helping you to feel better um, and keep yourself safe. Yeah. Qu quick fun fact sidebar. Yeah. Um, yes. You were mentioning like insurance policies, what, what they don't cover and read your policy, know what it says. Yeah. So for here in the tri-state New York, New Jersey area, was it 2011, uh, Sandy, Hurricane Sandy? Mm -hmm. 2012, 12. So th that was big. That was one of the, the the larger, more destructive hurricanes to, to hit the area. And mm -hmm. there's a reason why it's called Superstorm Sandy, not Hurricane Sandy, because it, it was a hurricane at one point category. I, I don't know what it was, mm -hmm. but by the time it actually made landfall, it, it was below category one, such that it wasn't technically a hurricane, it was a superstorm. Mm -hmm. The insurance companies were fighting to have it so categorized as a hurricane because guess what? Most people's policies didn't cover hurricane loss. Correct. They covered storm loss. Yes. So uh, governor at the time, uh, Chris Christie, I believe, love him or hate him, but he at least mm -hmm. advocated for the state that no, this was a storm, not a hurricane when it hit land. Therefore, Prudential and other insurers were out however right. many hundreds of millions of billions of dollars to cover this stuff. Right. So your policy matters and the wording matters. So. Yes, and uh, importantly, like you said too, the state that you live in, because there yeah. are some states that would have been like, whatever. I mean, California, yeah. again, very strong. They're like, if you want to be anywhere in this state, you're covering people for fire, right? Because everyone's like, oh yeah, we're not touching it. So it, it is important and you're right, is they will have fights. And I mean, it's devastating. Can you imagine like having your whole home destroyed and then you're having like, yeah, no, you know what? There's this little word here and it uh, says, yeah, 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 exactly. There's a reason why policy is so long. There's so many things it doesn't exactly. cover is, is why right. it's so long. But, and yeah. also a lot of them don't cover mold for that same reason, mm. because you know, if you have a flood, you're probably gonna be like, you know what? It's just a flood, it's an inch in the basement. I'm just gonna whatever. Well, guess what? Yeah. That mold starts growing. Yeah. And in five years from now, when your kid is allergic and you find out you have this, they're gonna be like, yeah, doesn't cover, doesn't Don't cover, cover it. mold. Yeah, oh man, it's too bad. So it's just really so, being smart about yeah. what you what your needs are. So what, what do you think are, are people's um, biggest, uh, not shortcomings, biggest mistakes, biggest things they overlook. It sounds like we're, we're kind of touching on that now, but to categorize emergency preparedness or lack thereof, mm -hmm. the big things, the big violations people do. Um, yeah, so it's not checking your insurance. So annually, right, just paying your um, premium every year is not really <laughs> checking it, Yeah. right? So it is about reviewing it. It is about the details of it. 
you find somebody like me who really thinks that's fun to look at all the details, really to understand what it is. Because also when you're in retirement, I think it's a really key point to review all of that, like your all your insurances, your disability, your life, because what you needed for a certain amount of time now that your life is going to change, right? And the revenue generating, it's actually going to be more important, right? That your home is valued at the right amount because when you retire, you're not going to want to have to go back out right, sure. to, work yeah. to cover that. Um, the uh, same thing is all of your advanced directives and medical. Um, mm. Healthcare proxy, please, everyone over 18 should have a healthcare proxy. And can um, you just walk, walk through those? I, I, I know people often get the terms confused. I myself forget sometimes. So everyone knows a will. That's what you want to happen right. to your stuff or be guardian right. of your kids if you have minors. Outside right. of that, what are the other big documents and what do they sure. do at a high level? So a trust is what you would put your estate into because a will is about saying, I'm going to give you this. Yep. So on my death, I'm giving that to Andy. If Andy is a child or is somebody that you feel can't make the decisions, then uh, that's why you, you ask, I'm still a child. A trust. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, just, right. I'm just using that for yeah, example. Uh, you know? <laughs> um, so a medical power of attorney is someone that can help make decisions. And also now because of the HIPAA laws, if you want someone else to get your medical information and be able to talk to doctors about mm -hmm. you, okay, that's medical power of attorney. Um, okay. The healthcare proxy is if you are un able to take care of yourself who makes your medical decisions for you so that's like that okay. life or death you know life support um and what's key about the healthcare proxy is it's not expensive because usually it's just notarized so you don't need to um it, you know don't think of it like a lawyer and it's like okay. a whole lot of money but the key is is that when you assign someone a healthcare proxy um it can be changed too is you want to communicate it to the person that you've designated is healthcare proxy and share yeah. with them what your wishes are. Right. Because you don't want some, oh, Andy, guess what? <laughs> Beth made you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you like, also really? want to, yeah, you, that is a document that you want virtual, that you want copies of, and that you want your doctors to know about it. Because the whole idea, and especially anyone that has children going off to college, is you want the doctors and everyone there to know it. Because it's not like when I went to school, they would have called up my mom and said, what do you do? It doesn't matter. Yeah, like right, nowadays, right. absolutely not. Um, so you want to make sure if your child wants that to make someone a power of attorney for them. Okay. And just curious, I, I know you said this is different state by state as uh, the age at which the doctors won't speak to the parent. Is it 18? Is it 21? Is it uh, a, universally? Uh, or in this no, country, you're right. It's, it's usually 18 because they say when your kid goes off to college, depending okay. on where they go. And I think it's, not so much a doc, it's the HIPAA laws now. So I think it is, okay, it okay. depends on what the state is, but pretty much like every trust and estates attorney is pretty much like when you turn 18, you know, get a healthcare proxy. Yeah. Um, and the power, you know, durable power of attorney. Um, if you have businesses, you do want, if something, if you're incapacitated for a short amount of time, right, you want your business to continue, your bill to get paid. So do you want a financial power of attorney, you know, yeah. all those types of things. And again, that's where, you know, I get into what the plan is, what is your life like, your activities, what is most important to you. And then we do go through all of these things. The whole idea is that you want it to be like smooth transition. Yeah. Um, one of the things I also do is an executor like index is, um, the idea when you pass, even if you have a will and a trust and all that, the executor still has to close up everything, has to take mm -hmm. care of everything. There's a lot of work to do. And a lot of people assign it to someone who is in the family who doesn't do that for a living. Yeah. Um, so to have everything all together and smooth so that they can, uh, you know, um, process it as smoothly um, is, is a good yeah. idea. So, so, so you act as executor for people or you mean you just help people select an executor it's not just like cousin joe um yeah no i i can help i can be okay. an executor um for someone because often what a lot of attorneys are saying it, if there is someone in your family it should be someone who's not in your will so okay that would be a little yeah yeah <laughs> conflict right. of interest right yeah. um a lot of families do it anyway 
Um, but that's what the advice is. And again, I think that's why over time, depending on what the makeup of the family is and, you know, yeah. all those personal connections, okay. um, people are single. Um, when you, if you're not married, if you don't have family, a lot of times too, is who are, who do you want to designate to take care of that? Um, you know, there are like different situations that people should think of is who, who do I have that I can trust? It, it's, um, similar to the emergency network that um, we create mm -hmm. for emergency plans is, you know, there are people that you should really think about is when times are tough, who is it you know you can count on? Yeah. And sometimes it may not be a partner. Um, you know, a lot of times with the healthcare proxy too, it, it people are like, no, it's not my spouse, you know, or my mother, right? Like my mother is going to keep <laughs> me alive no matter what, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, people who find it emotionally difficult or would who would make decisions that they would want the whole idea of healthcare proxy is to fulfill your wishes so right. that can sometimes you know is a heavy conversation and i think that's important to note so people think about as generally people think about estate planning they think oh that means a will and they also think that just means what happens after you die but it's it's not estate planning in general is broader and it's also while you're alive who's going to make those legal decisions, financial decisions, healthcare decisions for you. Right. Um, so this is all important stuff to consider. Right, right. And you don't have to be like a cajillionaire. Um, again, yeah. everyone works hard. So it's about things that you love and you care about. Um, pets are really important to people. And a lot of people are, you know, not putting, that's a trust, you know, they're documents yeah. for pets of who is going to get, you know, little joe or you know uh, right. um and, and and even if something happens same thing is if you're living on your own and you have a pet or well, what if something if you have to be in the hospital for eight weeks i mean that sound that may sound unimportant to someone but for people who that's a family member that's very important you know yeah um and that causes stress and emotion things like that um you know, especially if your dog is like a mastiff, you know, like I'm not taking care of that dog for you. So you got, you got a horse living in the house now. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> well, and pets enter into emergency plans a lot because you hear a lot of stories where people run back into the house for a pet. Mm. So when you say they enter into, uh, do you mean you have to have the discussion with people? Like if your house is on fire, you do not go back in that house is, is, is what you're getting at or? Yeah, the, the idea is so, and this is like one of those like stats that you won't know is when your fire alarm goes off, how long sh should it take you to get outside? I remember when I was in elementary school, they used to do this thing called Edith exit drills in the home, <laughs> E-D-I-T-H, where, and it was fun at first, we did it, you know, our, our, our teachers advocated, go home, set up with your family. So you'd run through the scenario of, okay, smoke alarm goes off. Where does everyone physically go? Do you go out the window if you have like a, you know, a garage mm -hmm. next to you, or do you go down the stairs or whatever? And we practiced and it was novel at first. And then, you know, right. passed after a week, we never did it again. But right. um, I, I should, I should know the answer to that, but I don't is where I'm going with this. Right, so okay, long? it's 10 seconds. Ten, okay. So yeah. when, so, you know, in movies, when alarms go off and people have to leave, right, they're running around the house trying to get stuff. So the reality is, is what is it you think you can do in 10 seconds? So can you get out of your bedroom in the dark in 10 seconds? Um, and that's where things with um, people aging, right, we want to be independent and, and age where you are. I live in New York City. So the reality is, is okay, like how many years can I open those windows and even now yeah. <laughs> pretty tough, you know, if mm -hmm. you're gonna get out a window or can you get outside? Um, what you need should be by the door so that on your right. way out, you can get it. Um, so let me, put, let me put you on the spot. Do you have a bag next to you right now? I have a bag, <laughs> yes, in my, in, my, in my closet. Okay. Um, and also the other thing is you should have two exits. And yep. a question back to you is how many fire extinguishers do you have in your house? one and it's 10 years old and it's in the basement next to the washer okay so now, for what it's worth I, I did check that it's still you know in the green so it's still charged but yeah it's it's probably yeah. the hardest place to get to in the house i had to run through the whole burning house to get it if i had to. right and where yeah. do most house fires happen uh kitchen i guess yep. mm -hmm. okay yeah so like everyone in your house should know how to use a, a fire extinguisher and also fire extinguisher should only be used on fires that are smaller than a waste paper basket so hmm. if something's huger, don't be spraying it, just get out. Okay, 
because it's not going to be effective, even if it's yeah. like an ABC where it's grease fire or yeah, what. Because again, at <laughs> ten seconds is where it's going to mm, like yeah. grow and okay. multiply. So if it if it's you need to be between the door and the fire, you know okay. wherever you're getting out. Um, oh wow! All yeah. Right. So yeah. what? Obviously, so we we touched on a lot now, like things to consider, things people should do, but sort of action steps, things people could or should yes. do now in anticipation of starting to think more seriously about emergency preparedness. Yes. Okay. So one is I would definitely dig out those documents, key documents: okay. your birth certificate, your social security card, the actual your passport, your driver's license, um, all those types of documentations in a waterproof fireproof container do, um do you also recommend uh digital copying and storing somewhere safe be it thumb drive cloud drive whatever yes for things that you can like for instance again even a copy of a birth certificate you need the original one uh -huh. um but yes like your policy should definitely be digital and i don't mean the two pager that you get every year <laughs> like i'm talking about the detail of it um but th those types of things, whatever you can definitely put on a flash drive, that's also in my go bag, um, okay. and, and share the information. You know, a lot of times partners, we, we silo jobs, right? Because there's just a lot to get done. But like medical information, all medications, doctors, all of that should be contacts where even the kids have it. Okay. Um, the kids should be able to know how to call the doctor, how to call your doctor if something happens to you. You know, yeah. I mean, there are things that we want, we want numbers of and, you know, prescriptions. I mean, everything is 15 letters long, you know, right, and right. they all sound the same. So um, list what they are. Okay. Just do you recommend people uh, to the extent they can get like duplicates of medications. So there's one to go, one to stay, or, you know, some medications you can't get advanced fillings of, but exactly. I know it's really <laughs> tough now. So yes, there are, there are, um, some if you can, but that's why I think if you have the medications on your phone, um, right. and in a Dropbox somewhere is the reality is, is, you know, CVS, if you call up CVS, cause something happens, you can get your medication. You can get an emergency. Staff. Okay, good. Um, if people, if their life's Saving life saving equipment and life saving medications, absolutely. Like, you can't go 24 hours without you, absolutely should have two weeks of it. Two, and yeah. people around you should have it. Okay, great. You know, like they should know about it and things like that. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I want to leave. So, we're at 8 45 yes. almost. I want to leave some time, some questions, and just okay. find out more about, about what you do. I, I think, you know, it took me a while to sort of visualize emergency preparedness as a service and how mm -hmm. you do it. So just to be clear, you're not selling homeowners insurance, right? No, I don't. You're, you're so independent much, consultant. Right. Yeah, okay. I'm a consultant. So I'm the advocate for, for the client. So okay. I'm there to create a plan that gives them the confidence that they will be okay through different, different perils, different yep. um, accidents. Um, and the idea is I review insurance, right? A lot of it is reviewing the information and bringing up is this is what this means. This is what you're covered for. This is what there were, there are holes. Um, yeah. And that's where, again, why I do a lot of networking with people because if they don't have a really great financial advisor, I wanna be able to connect them with somebody. Um, and vice versa, there are just a lot of things where people you know, are intimidated to ask their lawyer about certain things, you know, right. um, it's intimidating for people. So we cover those things. So yeah, but I don't sell any of those products. So mine's okay. my, my time, the work I do, I do like the heavy lifting. Um, I do white glove con concierge, like I do people's home inventories. Okay. Usually people don't do. want to okay. do that. So, so, so maybe can you just walk through a typical, typical client hires you it's like Beth, I, I realize I, I need to be more attentive to this stuff. Uh, right. what do you do? So it sounds like obviously you, you help them review insurance policies, point out what's covered, what's not, I guess, recommend to the extent there's deficiencies in coverage, but, um, yeah. like what else is included yeah. in what you sure. do? I do a needs assessment. Um, so okay. a lot of it is then if there's specific requests that they have, like a lot of people coming out of the pandemic are like, right, I'm not prepared for aging and death and you know a lot of people in my family so what do i do what i need to get together so okay. what i do then after the needs assessment the discussions about what is most likely to happen and most what they're most worried about is i give them like a project plan so they can okay. do a menu whether it's like a family emergency plan if it's your 
um, uh, cataloging your ID and your vital documents. You know, there are just things that people know they need to do, and they're like, never going to do it. You know? uh, right, right. Right? Um, uh, so, you know, insurance, a lot of that review is about this is what you have, this is where you're missing, this is, we do cost analysis of what the difference is, um, preparing for their, their, Death. I mean, I, I still right. don't like saying it. Um, hard, hard to say, yeah. Helping get all your information together for an executor. I mean, that's usually when people finally do their will and trust. They're like, okay, that I'm done. I can't even deal with it. So yeah. whatever else I need to have together to be handed to my um, executor, like, please get it together. Um, okay. When there are family passings, I've gone through people's houses to find all of their policies. You know, they're like... Mm military you know documentation um because again a lot of that is technical and a lot of the lawyers are like okay yeah you're gonna pay my fees for me to send someone in there to do it um yeah. so a lot of times it's getting the information ready for the lawyer and that on-site stuff do you do that uh, you know uh pandemic aside do you do that nationally or are you really just based in new york with offering that um, in New York, but I can travel. I can do it. It's it's like any other consultancy. It's just depending okay. on what the project is and the workload. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. So uh, for people who are interested, uh, we'll, we'll go to some questions next. So okay. Beth, your website, your company name, Evergreen Ally, right? Yes. And this is your web address. People can find them on yes. your service, reach out to you, ask you questions, et cetera. Yes. Contact me. You can um, just ask me questions. It's Beth at Evergreen Ally. Okay. Um, please mention that you, you know you were on the show, and I'm happy to answer any questions for anyone. Okay, awesome. Any uh, parting words before we, we jump into some some questions here? Um, just know that it's it's not as overwhelming. Um, it's one of those things where one step at a time, and really keep the goal, what your goal is, and what's most important to you, and who's most important to you. That's really the work that you need to do. Um, to have uh, a good emergency preparedness plan. Don't get sidetracked by the bells and whistles. Yeah, that, that's excellent advice. It, you because mm -hmm. it's easy to get overwhelmed to just give up, right? When yeah. you when you re absolutely. Yeah. Okay, uh, David Fultz, frequent contributor to the group here. How do you suggest dealing with the complicated legalese when it comes to understanding homeowners insurance, auto insurance policies, etc.? I mean, other than uh, hire someone like you, um, any recommendations for someone who wants to kind of DIY it, if you will, with uh, this? Um. Yeah, it's a good question um, because it really is like just doing a lot of it is you get used to what the wording is. If you find a really good broker, someone who sells all different types of policies, um, oftentimes what they would do is they'll give you a free consultation on this is what you have right now. Okay. And but come with specific questions like what are the types of things that I'm covered for and what are the things that I'm not covered for? Because that often is like hidden and like that's on page like 42, whereas uh -huh. most people right need it right away. Um, and so that's what I would use those questions to get a specific answer. But a lot of times really good insurance brokers will give you a good analysis of what you already have and answer your questions. OK, great whether or not they end up getting into a different policy. I mean, I guess probably right. part of their reason, you know, part of their incentive is to do that, but hopefully at least right. give you a- Right, but brokers yeah. are agents for you, right? So they're mm. the ones helping the client get the best um, policy. Okay. If you go to someone who's at like a specific place, then that's where, yes, they're gonna be, you know, they're, they're only selling that kind of policy. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, definitely. Um, here's more of a comment, less less of a question, okay. but Cody Garrett, we often look for upside rather than looking for ways to protect from downside and not just financially yes. or annuities. Yes, um, yes. And yeah. then that's what, thank you, Cody. Yeah, I mean, I, I try to be, you know, I, it's, I don't want to be the, like the scary, oh my God, girl, you know, like the perils. You know? Right, right. Um, it really is about giving you the confidence, you know, like I know what to do. Um, and, and also realizing that panic, you know, like think about your panic reaction. Do you freeze? Are you a fighter mm. or do you flight? Yeah. Okay. Cause that really also needs to be addressed, you know, in, in the family, but you're right. And it just, I try to twist it into keeping as many choices as possible, right? Okay. Um, so the more choices that you want is the more information that you probably want to know 
like what your options are instead of being stuck at the end. Exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, kind of a techie question, but do you okay. trust online storage sites like Dropbox to keep scanned copies uh, safe? If not, what do you suggest instead? Um, I do. I do trust Dropbox. Um, I also think that you should have it in a portable little stick. Okay. Um, a lot of, and actually, Andy, you should probably get into this. A, a lot of financial firms offer like a safety place for you to keep a lot of your information. Yes. Um, that's something that I think is really up to every client. Um, so I think Dropbox, which again is an independent and has no stake in the game, is, mm -hmm. is a good safe um, place. Yeah, yeah, there are, um, the, for what it's worth, the financial planning software I use has a client portal included with that portal is a secure file sharing vault where not only does that let us exchange documents back and forth in a you know 256 bit encryption, like bank level encryption environment, right. but there's unlimited storage for people to save whatever. That's that's the ideal spot and it's all cloud-based. You can access right. it from your mobile phone or any right. computer. Right. Um, store up copies of your policies, of your legal documents, of anything right. else, statements you need, et cetera, proof of right. like basis in shares you bought 20 years ago, like you know, right. things like that, that you, you can't recreate, so. And what I would just add, Teresa, is just make sure you need to feel comfortable that your financial institution is really keeping that stuff that you have access to it and that they don't have access to it. Yeah, that, that, that's a good one. Now, how, how do you do that? Practically speaking, like how do we, let me just take your comment down here to so mm -hmm. save up some screen space. Like how are any of us supposed to know best practices for who has a good encryption, what they're actually doing with their data? Like other than reading through their, you know, 50 page disclosure, right. um, what are your tips for like, how do we find best in breed financial institutions yeah. and whatever with regards to that? Um, when it comes to the financial institutions, I think that's where you ask people that you trust. Okay. Um, what I think with Teresa's question was, is where, are, where, where am I gonna save all the other stuff? So I may have an account with you, but does that mean that I'm gonna put my will in your, mm. like that's where I have a more unease with that. I don't advise that to people. I okay. think they make the decisions of something that is safe. And that's why I think Dropbox, because the key is them to have access to it. Because at Got the it. end of the day, it's not like having bonds, right? You're not running around with this. It is, it is digital. You want digital access. You want your passwords. You want all that. I worry about, and a lot of emergency preparedness products that you've seen in the past are all these like digital cards and it all is about digital and it's about you entering all your information into something and don't you feel better and now you're safe okay. yeah well no really because like what am i doing <laughs> now to, you know like uh, when there right. was a fire or the pandemic and all that kind of stuff so the digital stuff is actually easy in that you do have, it's a lot of writing down. You do need to keep accounts and names and, and passwords. And I think families need to share it. And even if someone just pays the bills, somebody else, you have to know where to go to get it. Uh -huh. um, that's what I think is accessibility because you don't want to not be able to pay your Con Ed bill because you don't know the password, you know? Right, right. Um, so, and, and stuff like that. But when it comes to financials, I mean, I think the financial institutions today are, are safe and reliable for the products they sell. It's about the security of all your other stuff, you know? Got it. Um, even your wills, there are some trust and estates attorneys, right, who will keep the copy of your will because you do need like the original. Physical copy, yeah. Um, right, so some people keep it in their safe deposit box. If you don't have another name on the safety deposit box, though, so that's bad because then again, you pass, no one can get the will that's like sitting uh, in your safety right. deposit box. So those are the types of things that each thing you have to think about. Um, and so you may know, I mean, yes, trust and state's attorney is a good place to have a will. Just tell other people the name of your attorney, you know, um, so they can, they can it's, get it. Right. Yeah. It's closing those loops and, and things that, that a lot of what I do. Great. Mm -hmm. um, 
fa fairly technical where to go okay. and you don't have to spend too much time on it. But okay. how do you actually estimate how much to insure? I guess in the case of a house, the person is right. asking here. Okay. So there are lots of different segments on your insurance. So the first one you want to look at is dwelling, right? That is your actual house. Um, again, you can go to a good broker. Um, but keep in mind that it's about rebuilding it. So depending on where you live in the country and things that happen, the cost of rebuilding a house yeah. in New York, then you have to think of labor and costs and all that type of stuff. So I would definitely use a good broker. Um, real estate people are good if they just know that like there's a shortage now of like building materials. You know what I mean? Right. They'll know what's happening in the industry. What, what you also want to look for are two other things when it comes to the dwelling. Then there's a part called extended replacement. Okay. That is a huge piece. What that says is, okay, if you're dwelling, say $300,000, right? Mm -hmm. That extended says, you know what? We're also going to put in, there's a section for about 25% overage, which means if the value of rebuilding, it's that house with that plan doing that today, that gives you a 25% leeway. That, that extended replacement is where you need to make sure how how big do you want to make that and how much do you want to pay in the premium? Because like okay. I, I have a friend whose house is, you know, she has a dwelling amount. Her, she doesn't keep up with that because her extended, um, her extended replacement is like two times the, the cost of the dwelling. So wow. she feels yeah. like she's covered. Okay. And then the third area on your um, insurance is the building ordinances. Again, for people who live in older homes, if you were to rebuild the house today, there are a lot of building upgrades and ordinances that have happened since your house was built. So that section mm. takes care of all that. And especially in states where, you know, now they're trying to, you know, um, you know, there are a lot of like, you know, the rooftops, right, are like fire retardant, and they used to not be. So that can be very, very costly, too. And then the, what what happened is if you rebuild your house, all of that would be out of your pocket. You'd have to put that in. Yeah. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. A question about oh, where to go. So regarding safe deposit boxes, how safe mm -hmm. are they? I, I guess this means in the physical sense of like flood and fire protection. Um, Perhaps you mentioned the, the risk of not having someone else's name on it, but otherwise, what are yes. your thoughts and are they good? I, I mean, my thoughts are they're safe. I've never heard any stories about that, that something happens in a bank safe. It is about the accessibility is now I know less banks, right? It used to be every bank has a safe deposit box. Now you have to like kind of travel really far for that. Yeah. But a lot of it is, is just what you have in there and who has access to it. Because if you, when you pass and your name is on it, anyone has to go to probate to in order to get something out of there. Um, in, depending on the state, if you have like a legal spouse, then they can go in there. But if you okay. don't have someone else listed on it, this is a good as we age and we want someone else to be able to access things is it does legally, you have to have somebody else on the account. It's the same thing with even like financial accounts is, you know, and it's a tough subject, but how we can help our parents is if there is a trusted member of the family who can also be co-signer on one account. So if something happens, at least, you know, you can pay some bills um, from it. mom or dad, you know what I mean? Without having to, yeah. Cool. Um, I, I got a, a question through text, so I can't okay. put it up on the screen here, but a, a relative okay. asked, Someone they know had uh, FEMA flood insurance. This was Hurricane Sandy, someone in, in mm -hmm, New York. Mm -hmm. FEMA flood insurance and no mortgage. They got paid out real fast compared to friends and neighbors uh, after Sandy. Is that because the, the mortgage companies got paid instead of the homeowners? Is there some other reason why some people, specifically those without a mortgage, would have gotten the FEMA insurance real fast, whereas others didn't? Do you happen to know? Okay. I, I, I don't know specifically... I may not know accurately what, what she's asking. So there's a couple things is no homeowner's insurance covers flood, period. Nothing does. Really? Okay. The way to get flood insurance is through the national, the national um, flood insurance. Okay. So, so that's technically um, where you get flood insurance. 
FEMA often comes in, and I think after Sandy is FEMA provides when there are disasters declared, right? Yeah. There are disaster money. A lot of times that FEMA money is um, a no interest loan. So sometimes uh, that's mm, people okay. also hit is where they get money right away and then they realize like, oh, I gotta pay it back. So that's why I don't know specifically about that example. If it okay. was that because they had flood insurance and when something like that happens, it's like, yes, it's declared national. Like that's where the declarations of the governors, you always see like it was declared in New York, mm, okay. you know, it's a, a disaster. They do that for that back end is for them to say, okay, yes, it was declared a disaster and now your coverage for it. So it could have been that it was the flood insurance that got paid out quicker. And if other people didn't have flood insurance, then they're trying to fight for money where it's like, oh, but it was like the storm, you know, it was wind oh, yeah. damage because wind is covered. And so that's where I'm not quite sure on that question, what okay. it was. That non specifically what they got and yeah. Right, okay. right. Um, I, Final, because we're nine o'clock here. So one final question. You may have touched on it, but I don't know if you specifically addressed it. I kind of zoned out as yeah. I was reading other questions. But what mm -hmm. happens to a safe deposit box if you die and didn't have anyone else on it? Does it go through probate or how yes. do other people get to it? Yes. Um, and that's where like the list of things to get together for your executor. Um, the executor's job is to find all the assets and dig this out. And that would be through interviewing like the, the family. Oh, where did she bank and things okay. like that. So yes, it would have to go through probate. Um, and then usually what will happen is if it's not specified in the will, um, who the court designates is the person that's, uh, you know, that's going through this pro the probate uh, yeah. guess, probate lawyer. Um, they are the ones that are now going to gather all this if an executor wasn't named and figure out the estate because the the key why the states get involved in different very state, but the state wants to make sure that when you die, you pay what you owe. <laughs> that's uh, yeah. the whole thing about an estate. So that's why things get frozen is because mm. at the end of the day, until the courts say, okay, yes, everyone's been paid and you don't owe anything. Yes. Now you can disperse like what it was based on, you know, the will or fight it out. Um, so okay. that's really why everything gets frozen. Okay. Um, and that's that another good example of also about retire um, as you plan for retirement is, um, Anything that you have, any policies, investments, any products that you have that gives the option to assign beneficiaries, it's better for you to do that because that does mm -hmm. not go through probate. It's faster, so, easier, skips all that nonsense. Exactly, right? yeah. exactly. Yeah. So I think a lot of people don't think that or they think, oh, I'm going to put it in my will anyway. It's like, no, if, if those products actually give you an option to set beneficiaries, yeah, I would do as much of that as possible. Yeah, and we, we that's a great point. We talk about that in the group all the time. So insurance products, whether it's annuities, traditional mm -hmm. insurance, name the beneficiaries, qualified retirement accounts, employer plans, IRAs, name the beneficiaries there. Exactly. Um, even we we typically, by we, I mean the group, you know, just kind of discuss and, and advocate. If you have regular non-qualified accounts, like regular checking account or brokerage account, you can name a TOD, you know, transfer on death which right. is in effect the beneficiary designation right, right. Um, to help to help skip this stuff. So yes. And that's where a lot of like, uh, I see people would save a lot of time and money is when they do all of that up front. And then yeah. it's, it's a lot easier to close up your state and settle everything. Um, yeah, it's much better. And also keep a copy like that beneficiary list that you have for each account mm -hmm. that I would save digitally. Really, just in, in case the institution messes it up or challenges you, or yeah, I've had I've had issues where you know, like, oh, we only give you five boxes and you have six people, mm. and so it's okay. like, yeah, we have it. It's like I, I'm just I I rather see it myself. Yes. <laughs> you know? yeah. So, um, but again, it doesn't hurt because also you can remember and you will always have that information of what you have sorted, especially when you go into your will, because your attorney's gonna have you like list everything too. And so it really just helps keep it all, you know, wrapped up that you have it all together. Yeah, no, uh, have it clean, have it together, have it organized, yes. right? That's- Yes. <laughs> oh, cool. Um, all right, I guess we'll wrap it there. So, so Tony says, this is a great okay. topic tonight. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> there's lots of good, I, I didn't bring them up, lot, lots of good comments and other folks kind of, you know, chiming in and, uh, 
encouraging others here. Um, David Fultz, thank you very much. Very important and timely oh, show. Thank you. So thank you, David Fultz. Um, so just to recap, if anyone mm -hmm. is interested in reaching out to Beth, company name Evergreen Ally, you can find here or Beth at yes. evergreenally.com. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yes, I, I'll give anyone a um, 30 minute consultation. I'm happy to talk with people. Um, and again, I just want people to know that they are in control and that they have choices, but you just have to do it now, not later. Yeah. And you do work with people throughout the country as far as whether or not you physically do yes. on-site stuff, that's to be determined, but otherwise yeah. you can do assessments and... Yeah, and I do a lot more. I mean, my my business was really white glove in people's homes because they didn't want to do it. And a lot yeah. of what I do are the things that people never get to. But, you know, during COVID, I had to do a lot more um, virtually. So there's a lot that we can do um, virtually without me physically having to go there. Okay, cool. Yeah. Just uh, one final check of comments here. Awesome guest. Oh, there thank you, you Look Cody. At that. Cool. My new best uh, friend. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, we'll wrap it here. Beth, thank you very much for coming on. Lots of great questions. Thank lots you. of great information. So I uh, appreciate your time. Okay. Thank you so much, Andy. Thank you, everybody. Okay. All right. Just stick around for a second after I uh, kill the broadcast here. Okay. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.